So, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. How are you feeling today? Excited? <laughs> yes, with you. First day of summit. This is our uh, third summit, but the first time we are here in the stage, we would prefer to be on the ground, but there is some <laughs> online audience, so we keep here in order to the people online could see us. I am Ricardo Salles. I am the CEO of Mais Diversidade, which means more diverse mm -hmm. in Portuguese. We are the biggest diversity and inclusion consultants in Latin America, working for many big companies in Brazil and also across the region in countries such as Peru, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Mexico. Costa Rica, Mexico, and another ones. I have started my diversity and inclusion journey uh, 18 years ago. I was starting my career and people used to say to me not to come out. They said that to me in order to protect me. I came from a very poor family. I came from a homophobic country, even nowadays. So people give, gave this kind of bittersweet advice to protect me. But I knew it was Impo impossible to follow it because I already knew that most of my strong, my impact came from the fact mm -hmm. I am a LGBT person. So I decided to work with diversity, equity and inclusion almost 20 years ago, being a pioneer in this agenda in Brazil. And I'm here with my business soulmate, <laughs> João Torres, my business partner, who is going to present himself to you. Hello, everybody. How are you? Hello. Feeling great, right? Yeah. First day. <laughs> I'm excited, too. I'm excited for both the information that we're going to get here, but for me, what diversity and inclusion gives the most is the ability to transform myself. So I realized that working with diversity and inclusion for almost 10 years, what uh, the biggest gift that I got from diversity and inclusion is that I can be a better human being every day. I can be a more humble person every day because you get to know stories, you get to know people, you get to know the uniqueness of people, and suddenly you realize how the world is beautiful and how everybody should be considered as a diamond. You know, I think for me, working with diversity and inclusion is not just something that I do from my brain, but it's something that I do from my heart because it helps me to transform, to be a better person and to create a bigger impact. That's the theme we're gonna talk about. We're gonna give a little bit of uh, hints and methodologies on how to, to enhance and to have a bigger impact on social impact uh, when we're working with these uh, corporate and community partnerships. And I've been working uh, with this team in the corporate world. And uh, in my Diversidade, we have a consulting and also an institute. On the consulting team, I'm uh, basically working in every area <laughs> with uh, Ricardo. And I'm also managing our institute that is the responsible for all our social impact uh, projects that we are handling in uh, Brazil and Latin America. So. That's basically what we're going to talk uh, a little bit uh, with you here. And I, I really hope that this, this journey you're going to get through these three days are going to touch, of course, your brains and you're going to get more knowledge. But I really hope it's going to touch your hearts and you're going to live here a better, better human being. Yes. So this is <laughs> us. Let's start. We are Mais Diversidade. As I told you, we are a diverse and inclusion consultants. We are focused on strategic consultants, uh, talent acquisition strategies, uh, researches, and also um, training in Brazil and across Latin America. Uh, we are a B Corp certified company, which means we are known as a company which does the best for the world and which is a pioneer in the ESG agenda. We, all, we are also a member of the LGBT Chamber of Commerce in Brazil and also part of the SDGs of the UN in Latin America. These are some of the, our clients. We work for many companies in, in the country. As I told you, we have uh, clients uh, in Brazil and across the region, and we offer 
to these different client solutions focused on diversity and inclusion, um, and we, we work in, with a variety of themes. So we work regarding people of color, uh, women, people with disabilities, seniors, and of course, LGBTQ people. Uh, Ricardo, so before you, yep. uh, I, I know it's not on the, on the topic of uh, exactly what we're going to talk about, but I just want to give some examples of how the, the theme of diversity and inclusion has grown in Brazil. Brazil is a country that has been uh, working with these themes of diversity and inclusion, I think, around uh, a decade. It's not, we're not like that advanced as the United States, but the theme has grown a lot. So we've, we've been uh, noticing many amazing projects that are really changing the way companies do business in Brazil. And I just want to give one example for you to know how we have, uh, how this team have evolved on companies. And I want to get the example of one of our clients that it's Gerdau. Gerdau, I don't know if, uh, does somebody know Gerdau here? Gerdau is a steel company that we have. It's the, the, it's a steel company from Brazil, but it's a huge steel company. It's a global competitor of steel. And uh, Gerdau, what they decided to do, I think, uh, almost two years ago, they decided to enhance the theme of diversity and inclusion in their value chain. So basically what they do, what they did is they look at their uh, supply uh, chain and they started a negotiation with their suppliers to make sure that their practices, their policies are also aligned with uh, all the diversity and inclusion discussions that they uh, have been having uh, so far. And uh, what they did, Gerdau created a huge uh, program on uh, education for, for its suppliers so they can know what is a diverse and inclusion program, what do I need to do if I want to be a more diverse and inclusive company, how, like for example, they created this, this uh, training platform uh, with us, we helped them to create this training platform for their suppliers helping them to understand how can I create a strategy of diversity and inclusion, for example? How do I structure a governance uh, on diversity and inclusion? How do I uh, measure uh, diversity and inclusion? What KPIs do I have for diverse, diverse, diverse and inclusion? What is the methodology for uh, calculating, for example, goals of diversity and inclusion? If I want to have more women, more black people, how do I calculate this? What are achievable goals and how do I uh, follow up on these goals? How do I make management on it? So I think it's such a beautiful program that we don't see a lot uh, uh, across the world. You know, companies are really uh, uh, helping their suppliers, their supply chain to have a, a more structured diversity and inclusion program. And Gerdau actually announced that uh, in a few uh, months or years, this to have a diversity and inclusion program, it's gonna count for them uh, to hire a new supplier. So it's, it's really gonna count on the criteria that they put on their purchase processes if the company has or, or if the company doesn't have a diversity and inclusion program. So I think it's just an example of how this discussion has been evolving a lot in, in Brazil and also in, in Latin America. And this is one of the projects that, at least for me, it's, uh, you know, we, we get proud of the, this type of projects. Yes, very proud. Thank you, João. So, a little bit of context. We come from Brazil. Brazil has a big population, 220 million people. We are a very diverse country, maybe one of the most diverse countries in mm -hmm. the world, but not an inclusive one. We are a country composed by 51% of women, Despite of that, women are only 13% of the executive leadership positions in the market. We are a country composed by 56% of black and brown people, but they are less than 5% in executive positions. In Brazil, according to a recent research, the, the LGBTQ population is 9.8%. Also in Brazil, one in each four person has any kind of disability. But we don't see these people occupying C-level positions or even executive positions uh, in the corporate world. So we have these inequalities mm -hmm. in, in Brazil and uh, a great defy that we have. This, uh, in addition to that, in the past four years, we are facing the Bolsonaro administration, we have this 
ultra far right president and things are not going well in the country in the past four years. During the pandemic, during the year of 2020, the LGBTQ community in Brazil suffered a lot. Suffered because they had no work and no help at all from the government. So we've decided we could do a little bit more. So besides the Mais Diversidade Consultants we have just introduced to you, we founded two years ago the Mais Diversidade Institute, which is our social initiative. So our work in the consultants is focused, as I told before, in women, people of color, LGBTQ, people with disabilities, seniors, etc. And in the Mais Diversidade Institute, we are focused exclusively on employability and also entrepreneurship for the LGBTQ plus community in Brazil. And this is what we are going to present you today. We are going to present this initiative. The name is Edital LGBT Mais Orgulho. It's an open call, a partnership between Mais Diversidade Institute and also Itaú Unibanco. Itaú uh, is the biggest bank in Latin America, a great partner of us in the country. And this initiative uh, is focused on helping different projects from the LGBTQ community in the five different regions of the country, of Brazil. So, this is uh, Itaú, as I told you, and before starting, we're going to see a, a video from Daniela Zen, which is the representative of Itaú. You have the sound. Com vocês, meu nome é Daniela Zen, eu sou da área de programas institucionais do Banco Itaú. É, hoje vocês vão conhecer um pouquinho de um projeto muito especial para o banco, que é o projeto edital LGBT Orgulho Mais, ele já vai para sua quinta edição, sempre com muito sucesso, sempre bate recorde de inscrições, é, acho que é importante dizer que a temática de diversidade, considerando todas as suas transversalidades, é muito importante e sensível para o banco, esse projeto faz parte dessa agenda de diversidade, é um projeto que visa incentivar é, o empreendedorismo, a geração de renda e dar visibilidade para as pessoas LGBT+. Então, vocês vão conhecer esse projeto hoje. Eu desejo que o, que o evento, que a discussão seja ótima. E a ideia é compartilhar com vocês os aprendizados e ouvir. Né? Quem sabe a gente sai daí com, com mais insumos para aprimorar cada vez mais esse projeto tão especial. Um ótimo evento para vocês e uma ótima discussão. So what we're going to present uh, here now is basically the methodology that we've been using to enhance this uh, social impact for the LGBTI population. And uh, this open call that we've been doing with Itaú, it has been happening for uh, we're going to our fifth edition right now, so it's like almost five years of a uh, project. So we have some good benchmarks on what worked there in Brazil, what didn't work, how can we uh, enhance this social impact. So that, this is basically what we're going to uh, share with you today. But just a little bit of context that here, Ricardo told that the scope of our institute is basically to find uh, more and to create uh, uh, more job opportunities for LGBT population and also entrepreneurship opportunities. So the focus of our institute is to the LGBT community and uh, on the workplace environment. Doesn't matter if it's uh, for getting like a formal job in a company or for the person to open its own uh, on job or for the person to create something like a new community that's going to generate income for this community like our object our objective is to help the lgbt population to get uh, income and to be uh, empowered in their uh, workplace so just a little uh, context and we did a uh, recent research on the entrepreneurship uh, scenario of uh, brazil in with partnership with itaú too and uh, we found out that the the main challenges that were pointed by LGBT entrepreneurs 
in Brazil was basically the lack of investment and uh, the lack of networking between them. And something very interesting that we found also was that it's pointed on the third point right there, is that these entrepreneurs, they usually hire other LGBT people for their businesses. So on this, we did like a, a, a national wild research with many, many uh, entrepreneurs, LGBT entrepreneurs in Brazil, and we figured out that 82.76% of this LGBT uh, plus entrepreneurs, they actively look for other LGBT people to hire them and to give them job opportunities, so which for us was, was something very interesting because if we create this network between these entrepreneurs, like we can uh, also strengthen the, the employability of these people. And uh, this is a little bit of the numbers that we have in this program. So as I told you, we've been working with this program for almost five years. And uh, we've had, uh, it, it's an open call, so we, we create this open call and people can subscribe uh, projects for us. So we had like uh, almost 2,300 projects that were uh, submitted for evaluation. And until today we had uh, 35 uh, projects that were sponsored all over Brazil. And we really mean all over Brazil. So we have projects in all the regions, all the states. We have uh, uh, many projects that are inside the rainforest in Brazil. So we have a very interesting project that is, uh, uh, the focus is for empowering uh, on entrepreneurship opportunities for black trans uh, women inside the rainforest. So they're beautiful projects that we, we, we are helping them to succeed. And basically what we do with this project is we have uh, this selection process and then we follow up with them for the next 12 months, both giving uh, advices and methodology on how to create a better, a better project, a better business on that. So we help them on uh, giving them financial support, uh, legal support, uh, project management support, and also money. So Itaú, as Ricardo told, is the biggest bank of Latin America, so they also help us on having this money so we can find, uh, put more money into this project so they can have continuity and, and grow and grow and grow. And uh, until today, we have uh, over 5,000 people that were uh, benefited directly and indirectly through this, this project. So we're gonna give you some examples. We created a video, but what we wanna discuss with you is basically like the methodology. What, what did well, what worked, and when we were uh, creating this presentation, we tried to create something that you could use as a benchmark, you know? If you wanna create also, uh, uh, if you wanna enhance social impact projects in wherever you live, so you could also benefit from this uh, methodology. And this is the question we wanna answer today. How do we promote this impact? So we put a few steps here that we want to follow up with you. The first one that we put here is this partnership between two complementary organizations. So Itaú is a bank, so a bank has money and they have uh, many knowledge that we can also get from them. So we partnership with them in our institute. Our institute entered with all this uh, project management uh, uh, methodology with the projects, and Itaú helped us with all this, this contact, all the, the money, and all the, 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 the spotlight on the projects because they have a big visibility in Brazil, so it was easier to get projects when we were using Itaú's uh, platform. So when we do this partnership between two organizations that are complementary, it helps us a lot. We also, everywhere we go on uh, diversity and inclusion uh, uh, events, we hear that uh, there is no competition on diversity and inclusion, and we saw that it, it's really true. You know, you can get together with your competitors, with other organizations, with uh, uh, other companies that are competitors to create a bigger uh, social impact, and it really helps. So the more institutions you can put together to create a unique result in the end, the better. So this is our first uh, uh, hint that we wanna, we wanna present to you today. The second one is to evaluate the impact and generate the data to guide the strategy and implementation plans. So we also based on uh, a few methodologies on how to measure social impact. We create our own methodology on how to measure the, the 
impact of this project. So all the decisions that are made during the, the execution and follow up of their projects are based on data. So we don't, uh, uh, although we have a good intuition, right, Ricardo? We, <laughs> we have a very good intuition, but we don't, we don't make decisions on these projects based on our intuition. We use data to, to, to support all these projects. And it's great to see that if you have data, you, ha you, you have uh, better arguments even to get more money from other institutions to help these projects too. Because what we see is like, for example, projects that came on the first year that we did this open call. After that, they could get more support, financial support from other institutions because they had this, uh, this data to prove their impact. So they could easily uh, ask for money. So for us, when we help them to, to generate data to show their impact, it, it also helped them on the continuity of these projects because this is one of our, our preoccupations. How can we, of course, start a new project? And one of the beautiful things that we did on Agital on, on this open call is we didn't want to have just institutions to sign up for the projects. We were accepting ideas. So people with great ideas, for example, this project that I just mentioned, the uh, black trans woman from the rainforest, they didn't have an institution. They didn't have a, like a fiscal uh, tax documents. They just had an idea of a project. And Itaú helped us to create, uh, 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 how do you say the pessoa jurídica? Like a, to create an institution, a, a company, an institution for them so they could receive the money and everything. And when we help them to create it and to make a good uh, management of their project based on data, after that first year that they were with us, they could get more financial support from other institute, institutions. So this is a, a big thing for us. And uh, one thing that we hear a lot, right, Ricardo, from our, our clients is like when we want to create uh, or foster a social impact project, we have dif difficulty on finding institutions and organizations that are uh, data driven because the institutions that work with social impact, they usually have dif difficulties on uh, management, on managing their, their institutions. So what we did was we, we, we got all this uh, project management methodology and financial planning uh, methodology and we helped, we helped them to create a more uh, strong uh, work of uh, way of working. The third one that we want to mention is to, to involve the local leaders on the process of continuous improvement and dissemination to other community leaders. So what we did, we got these people that they won this on the last, uh, last year, we got the people that won the open call for the previous years and uh, we put them as a ambassador of our open call. So basically what we did, we, we created like a, a community uh, communication strategy that they could uh, openly speak that they are ambassadors. We created videos, media, we uh, discussed with the local media uh, companies to give space for them in the local media. So we basically put the spotlight on these local leaders so they could uh, have a better image on the community that they live and people would uh, rely on them to find uh, better financial opportunities for their projects. So uh, we didn't want our, uh, we, we, wa we really wanted to decentralize the leadership of the, of the open call. So we got these people that won and we put them as ambassadors of the projects and create a whole communication strategy so they could support the new projects that were going to come um, that were going to come in place. The fourth item that I want to put for you is to promote the development of proposals aligned with the focus of the open call through uh, workshops, for example. So what we did, we noticed that people that had great ideas, they didn't know how to submit a project, for example. They had great ideas, but they didn't have the knowledge how, on how to submit a project. So before we start with the open call. We created these workshops so we could help people to uh, create a more robust uh, project plan, for example, to submit on this open call. 
And uh, it was very interesting because we put, uh, we created like rounds of, uh, of uh, networking, we created rounds of, uh, of uh, knowledge for the, the, the people that wanted to submit ideas. And we noticed that uh, the ideas that came as a result of that was, were ideas that were very robust. So they were very uh, well aligned with what we expected from. So we decided to start this phase of uh, education before the open call. So we were going to educate on them on how to create a good uh, uh, idea that was completely aligned with the focus of the open call. And to prioritize some uh, intersectionalities in the selection process. So for us, one criteria that is very important is uh, region. So we really consider projects in every region of Brazil, in every state. We just, do, we don't want to have just projects selected on Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. We, run a, we really want to have projects all over Brazil. We have projects in the rainforest. We have a lot of projects in the favelas uh, uh, in, in Brazil. So we really want to prioritize uh, the regions, the different regions in Brazil. And another criteria that we prioritize during the selection process is the intersectionality. So we see, okay, this, is a, uh, this looks like a good project, but let's analyze it through the intersectional, uh, intersectionality uh, lens. For example, this, this one that I mentioned of, of the trans black women in the rainforest is perfect because it has all the, the criteria that we want to, to, to find on a good project because we know that also these projects are the ones that receive less uh, financial support from other institutions. So we, wanna, we want this to be a, a criteria. So we put race and ethnicity as a plus when we are analyzing the projects. We put uh, 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 gender, we put people with disability, people who are 50 plus, and refugees also as a criteria to receive more points and to be more well uh, evaluated uh, on the selection process. The sixth item that I wanna put is to involve in the selection process, employees, of course, from, from both organizations or for all the organizations that are working with, and other representatives of civil society. So we have uh, on the selection process, uh, the last uh, moment of the selection process is a... A book of like a... A committee, a, a committee that is constituted by the people that represent this, the civil society, people from the, the LGBT movement. So we really want to uh, make this process a participative process with people that represent the civil society and they are fighting for LGBT rights. So we can have a, a really robust selection on this process. And all the projects that come, they are so beautiful, no? We, we were like, uh, I think a month, two months ago, we were on, the, on this, uh, final uh, community selection, selecting the process. And I had the same, uh, I was in one room, Ricardo was in another one, and after we left, we were talking and we had the same impression that, wow, how many great ideas we have to, 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 to put in place in Brazil. And we were like shocked on the, the quality of the ideas and how great they are. We didn't want to select, I don't know, uh, 10 projects. We wanted, we wanted to select like 100, but <laughs> we didn't have all the money for it. So uh, it's just a, a matter of uh, showing the potential that uh, LGBT people have to, to, to create their own impact. They just need sometimes uh, uh, an opportunity to do so. I'd just like to add that this initiative is very important right now in Brazil because of the Bolsonaro administration. For the past four years, there is no money coming from public policies for LGBTQ people in Brazil. Four years without any money for LGBTQ policies. So this initiative is, is important because of that thing too. Yes, and... As Ricardo said, many initiatives were lost. Like, for example, the, when uh, uh, Bolsonaro was just uh, elected and he cut all the money for, for projects for LGBT people, we received many projects for LGBT artists, you know, for, for art. And it's not on the scope, but we saw, like, suddenly, I don't know, like 500 projects that, w that wanted their project to be approved for art, that it was not on the scope, but as he cut it, all the, the money for these initiatives, people were trying to get money from everywhere. And it, like, it, it shocked us in a way, like, you know, it, it really touched us because 
like how how could we help like we we, we didn't have many things to do but this 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 uh, initiative and uh, thank god to the <laughs> to the money of uh, the data is investing on it it's like helping many people to go from zero to somewhere because all the the money was for lgbt projects were cut from from the government and uh, seven point uh, associate financial with technical support to winners, ensuring the implementation of the project and supporting the search for sustainability after the one year support cycle. So after the projects are selected, we follow up with them for one year. So it's 12 months follow up that they are done even with uh, online checkpoints, submission of reports and our team go goes to the places to check with them. So they go to every area, they go to the rainforest, they go to Northeast, they go to the favelas, they go there and they check how the project is being implemented, what difficulties they have, what challenges they have, how can we uh, help them on having, on create a, a bigger impact. Uh, on, on a few of the projects we also go, right, Ricardo, on a few of them we also go to check in person, you know, the projects that are having the, the, the biggest results. And uh, it's impressive how these projects are really helping the people to, to have something for them and to have continuity. This is one of our biggest uh, fears, is that the projects wouldn't have continuity, but they are having, many of them are having continuity. So we have projects from the first year that until today, are being supported by, by uh, another financial institution because they really created a, a, a very important a cycle of, uh, of uh, social impact. Promote networking with organization at different levels of maturity so they can exchange knowledge and support each other. This is very, very important. This is one of the most, uh, I don't know, it's, it's one of the, 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 the things that people like the most, you know, when they have this networking opportunities with other leaders of projects, with other organizations, with other companies, with other institutions, with people from uh, who are fighting for, for LGBT rights, you know, when we create these networking opportunities so they can know each other, they can create more value when they're together. This is one of the things that, uh, that uh, creates the most value for the people who participate in the project, to actively promote networking opportunities for everybody who is involved. It really helps them to, to, to go to their next level. And what impact are we promoting? And I wanna just pass this video with a few examples of the projects that are being uh, uh, enhanced by us. And uh, of course the video is in Portuguese because people don't speak English, but we put the subtitles in English for you. E o empreendedorismo através da Saboari. Nós já temos alunos que estão aqui fazendo ainda a oficina, nós estamos na quinta oficina, né? nós tivemos algumas, tivemos teóricas, três teóricas, né? e tivemos agora as duas práticas e vamos fazer mais práticas, nós estamos oferecendo o material para que eles possam fazer e, e dizendo para eles onde comprar, como comprar, para que eles possam estar fazendo isso, né? E aqui é o projeto Alimentando Sonhos, que está sendo executado em parceria com o Instituto Mar Diversidade e o Banco Itaú. E é com grande honra que nós estamos encerrando hoje as atividades desse projeto de capacitação profissional na área da panificação. O grande viés dele era justamente capacitar pessoas LGBTs em situações de vulnerabilidade, que é o público-alvo da Casa Florescer Maranhão, onde o projeto está sendo executado. O projeto Axó, ele na verdade foi sendo pensado aos poucos, né? Como a gente sabia que aqui é um lugar de, que tem uma demanda grande, porque Cachoeira né, é esse território, é esse contexto que a gente tem muito afro-baiano, né, onde a gente tem a religiosidade de matriz africana muito presente. Então a gente sabia que existia essa, esse, é, essa demanda de consumo desses produtos. Esse projeto ele é uma parceria do Fonatrans com o Instituto Mais Diversidade e o Banco Itaú. Qualifica e empodera mulheres é, é, na qualificação profissional e na busca por alternativas de trabalho, profissões alternativas que tire essas mulheres 
da linha de, da, da violência é, 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 doméstica, da violência social, da violência financeira, da misoginia, do sexismo e do feminicídio. Essa ação traz oportunidades de emprego e empreendedorismo para as pessoas que, às vezes, pode não ter essa oportunidade de estar sendo contratado por uma empresa e, a partir daí, aprender um ramo novo de trabalho. E chegou em um momento que, quando eu não tinha nada, esse projeto chegou com tudo na minha vida e acabou fazendo algo que estava precisando na minha vida. É o que? Atenção, é ocupar a mente naquilo ali, dedicação, fazer tudo com cuidado, com amor, com carinho. Esse apoio que o Banco Itaú, junto com o projeto, nos deu foi mais ou menos para mostrar que nós, LGBT, temos capacidade, temos inteligência para fazer algo que venha ser valorizado por pessoas de nível alto, baixo, nível médio. E é isso, é muito importante para o dia de hoje, infelizmente, a nossa sociedade não tem abrido muitas portas, não só em questão de cursos, mas também de questão de empregos, e esse curso faz com que a gente mesmo abra a nossa própria porta para poder se entrar nas áreas da sociedade. Nós nos sentimos com missão cumprida e realizar aqui no projeto Alimentando os Sonhos, Instituto Raíssa Mendonça. E, portanto, nós agradecemos do fundo do coração o edital Orgulho LGBT, comentado pelo Banco Itaú. Nós só temos é, a agradecer por esta oportunidade de termos trabalhado ao longo de seis meses né, durante a execução deste projeto. E o resultado é isso, são pessoas felizes e qualificadas profissionalmente. E aí eu quero aqui agradecer prontamente o Fonatrans, agradecer ao Instituto Mais Diversidade, ao Itaú, por essa parceria auspiciosa que impactou, mudou vidas e mudou para melhor. Just a little bit of context. This last woman who spoke, her name is Giovanna Baby, and she's a historical activist in Brazil. For us, she's like Marsha P. Johnson. You know, she's she's fighting since the the 70s in Brazil. So they are a very involved person with the community. Well, they are beautiful. The projects, like I get personally uh, emotionally involved when I'm in contact with them because. You know, it, 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 you don't need to complicate too much. You, you just need to find a way to give uh, people opportunity for them to show their value, you know, and to show their light. And uh, it started with an idea that we had, like a small idea. And suddenly when we saw it was growing and growing and growing, now the impact is like huge. And it just started with our desire to, to, to help, uh, to facilitate and give more opportunities to LGBT people who would never have this opportunity, you know? So for me, the biggest lesson when I see all this, everything that involved so, evolved so far is like, we don't need to complicate, to overcomplicate things. We just need to have this desire and start doing from somewhere, you know, because the right uh, opportunities, they are gonna come to you if you have a, you have this desire. And just to summarize what we talked about uh, before uh, Ricardo is speaking a little bit more and we open into questions, how do we enhance this impact through corporate community partnerships? So these were the points that we, we talked about. First one was to partner with different uh, organizations and organizations that are complementary, of course, complementary on knowledge, on network, on, on uh, uh, um, on uh, supplies, you know, different organizations. Number two, design the initiative and its implementation uh, plan based on data. This is very important. If you wanna give uh, substance and if you wanna have a, a more uh, robust approach with uh, financial institutions, you should have at least a methodology to calculate the impact of the projects. Number three, engage the potential beneficiaries in the formulation of the initiative and in the process of continuous improvement. And uh, it's also connected with the, the number four, that it support potential beneficiaries to see the value of all the initiative and engaging on it. So basically, what uh, this, this uh, initiatives talk about is to put the spotlight on the leaders of these projects, on the leaders of the regions, of the leaders of community, so we can empower them and give them voice so other people will feel inspired by them. Number five, for the selection process, establish criteria to prioritize beneficiaries, beneficiaries based on the data collected. So also based on data and 
what we talked about is to, to, um, to observe also the, the criteria of uh, intersectionality, regionality, you know, to, to go to the criteria that are more difficult for people to get uh, fi uh, financiation, fi finance from, to get money from. Number six, for the selection process, involve other important actors on the evaluation phases to guarantee its credibility. It's very important, at least on the final phase, to involve people from the LGBT movements, from your region, from your country, so you can have more, uh, a more uh, robust decision making. Uh, number seven, match financial to technical support to ensure the maximum impact on the initiative. This is what we were talking about on the follow-up of the projects, you know, to have this consistent follow-up on them and to help them with this methodology of uh, uh, project and business management for their projects. Number eight, keep in mind that facilitating connection and networking among beneficiaries has the potential to amplify the impact of the initiative. Yes, it's what we were talking about, uh, networking. So creating this networking facilitating, proactively facilitating these networking opportunities for everybody who is involved will help them also to go to their next level because they will create a, a bondage between them and also find other opportunities to be together. And number nine, evaluate the results and measure the impact of the program to ensure the continuous improvement. It's very important to have this methodology of, uh, of uh, measurement of uh, impact. Have another initiatives under the umbrella of Mais Diversidade Institute, and I'm going to show you some of them. The first one is Cozinha e Voz. It is Kitchen and Voice. It is mm -hmm. a project focused on forming trans people to work in restaurant kitchens. So yeah, we are helping them to be chef's assistant. We have formed more than 300 people in the past two years, and our challenge is to connect these people with the biggest restaurants in Brazil in order to increase the employability of them. We have this project that is a project from our heart, that is uh, an intersectionality project connecting LGBTQ+, and also uh, the question of generations, age. We know that most of the LGBTQ people who are today in their 60s, 70s, they, I could say, they couldn't enjoy this diversity and inclusion boom. When they were in the corporate world, there was only prejudice. So we have this idea to help uh, 50 plus LGBTQ people in the country to become entrepreneur as well. Uh, l this year, we launched the first HRC index in Brazil. You guys know it for many, many, many decades in the US. So we launched that initiative this year in June in Brazil in partnership with Human Rights Campaign. This was the first Equidade Brazil, just like you guys do in the US and in some countries of Latin America. And last, but not least, uh, as I told you, we are facing a far-right government in Brazil right now. The last four years have been easy at all for people of color, for women, for people with disabilities, and also for the LGBTQ plus community. We have no help at all from the Brazilian government. In a moment in which all the world talk about ESG, we think that it's important to reinforce that is there's no ESG without democracy. And nowadays, we don't have a democratic president. We have elections in Brazil in 10 days, and we really hope we can send Bolsonaro home. <laughs> In that direction, in that direction, we launched last month in partnership with Out and Equal and also uh, Forum de Empresas e Direitos LGBT. It is an organization that reunited 150 companies in the country. We launched these open letters to the presidential 
candidates uh, in which they would say they are for the LGBT rights. You can imagine who signed it mm -hmm. and who hasn't signed that. Mm -hmm. So we hope for the best in 10 days mm -hmm. after our election. So this is our context. We can follow us online and we are here for the Q&A session right now. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any questions for our speakers today? Any comment, maybe? Any idea? Any thoughts? Please feel free to share with any joke. Y all. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. This has been incredible. Um, so you said that after the first round, when they pair with the bank who does the financial backing, how do you find the next group of people in year two to help financially support these projects after they've been through the first year of benchmarking? You mean the first uh, projects that were? Yeah, so you said that like the first, you select these projects yeah. to go forward and you pair them with the bank yeah. to, to do the financial support and the backing there. And then because of the lessons that they've learned through this first year, oftentimes they'll find additional financial supporters. Exactly. Um, how do you help connect those successful projects with the second round of financial support after they've had the first round with the partnership that you've set up? Good. Uh, actually, on the first year, something very interesting happened because there, was a, there were a few projects that the bank uh, Itau really liked, it, so the, the bank <laughs> gave more money to, <laughs> to this project for the, the con continuity of them. But I want to stress the importance of the networking item that we put there, you know, because we don't... Uh, uh, we partner with other companies, but we also partner with some uh, organizations like the United Nations, the ILO, the United, the International Labour Organization. So we try to uh, uh, make these networking sessions also with other uh, organizations. So when they're doing these uh, networking opportunities, they uh, also can find this, uh, this uh, other support uh, opportunities, you know, but uh, what we realized is that the projects that had uh, the biggest impact, they could uh, show their impact based on the methodology or in some other way, they easily found uh, uh, financial uh, opportunities to continue with their uh, work. It was not hard, but the projects that had difficulty on measuring their impact, it was much harder for us to help them to to be connected with other institutions. So if I could inf reinforce the networking item that we put and also the, to have a methodology to, to calculate, the, to measure the, the impact, I would say that these are the two most important items if you wanna continuously helping them to find other um, financial support. Yes, and many of the, these projects, they they are helped by other organizations for mm -hmm. a year two, a year three. Yeah. So we, we do this first seed, mm -hmm. you know? We gave this first seed, and after that, other companies or institutions can help them. And it's interesting because it reminded me the... Andrea. No, this year we, we changed it the way we put money on mm -hmm. them, you know? Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Because on the first year, what we did, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, the same amount of money for every project. So I think if I'm not wrong, it was like uh, for every starting project, we had like $10,000 for that project. And uh, now what we did, we created uh, subgroups. Uh, sub, uh, sub so for example, uh, seed, uh, uh, we call seed capital. So it's like for a project who is just an idea, who is starting, they receive a little less. For a, a project that is more established and it's going to its second round, they receive a little more. For a project, for an institution, that it's already working for many years, it's already recognized, they receive much more money. So we divided also the criteria by which we give them financial support. So it also helped with these other organizations that go to their second or third year. The question, uh, we have here two more questions. Hi, how did you guys um, source the the projects, and how you know what was the process in that? I mean, I you know for us, we were just talking. You know, we can see getting the funding, but like getting the projects to get submitted. What kind of um, you know outline did you guys follow to to get that word out about that you guys were doing this for the projects to yeah. be? 
Uh, you mean for them to submit the project? Right, right, for the submission. Yeah. Okay, so uh, do you want to talk about the submission project? Okay, so the basically is we have a, a platform that it's a platform for uh, for for open call. So we have a, this very it, it's very well known platform in Brazil. So everybody who wants to submit a project, for example, for an open call, they have like open calls for everything there. So it's a well known platform that works with. Uh, many different projects in Brazil. So this platform, it has already a selection process inside. So we put all the criteria that we want. We put all the, like for example, what does the person want to achieve or the results, what the person is gonna measure. If you want the person can submit a, a file, a video for example, and all the, the selection process is done inside this platform. So we set up the platform exactly on what we are uh, looking for the projects. And as the platform is a platform that it's non-national wild, many people know that if they go there, they will find an open call. But also Itaú has a large visibility. So we use Itaú's uh, social media to also uh, foster and, and boost this, the, 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 the search, the, the, the how, how the project, yeah, how, how the people will see this project. And as João told you, in the first year, we received many, many kinds of projects. So since the last year, we decided to focus on entrepreneurship, generation, income generation, and also employability. Mm -hmm. So uh, because it was, in the contrary, we would receive more than a thousand pro cultural projects, sports projects, mm -hmm. and we, we don't have funding to that. And one thing important is the workshops that we did also before the subscription. So before opening the open call, we <coughs> created many workshops for the people who were interested on the open call. So we told them about the selection process, what would be measured, and we taught them how to fill up the form and how to, to go through every process of the selection process. So it also helped for people to go with uh, a strong project to that, you know. Yes, thank you. Um, guys, incredible project, and thank you so much for your work. This is really, I'm sure, quite a, quite a game changer for all the organizations that you're assisting. Um, two questions. One is the importance of data. How do you measure social impact? Which metrics specifically are people using, or which do you find to be the most compelling in, um, in the evaluation of the, of the projects? And second, um, do you know of other organizations similar to yours in other parts of the world? Uh, okay, let me start with the first one. So the, fir <laughs> the first one, what we did, I'm not sure if I can give uh, uh, details now, but I can get your contact and give after, because what we did, we researched our team of the Institute, we researched many uh, methodologies on how to measure social impact, and based on our reality, we created our own. So we have this uh, unique methodology that we've been using for all the, the projects, not just the open call, but we use for the other projects, you know, the Cousine Voz, the other projects that Ricardo uh, passed on the end. We also use this methodology to help them to, to show their, their value. I'm not sure if I can give you much details because we did like a, a, a collection of everything and that's what we use, but you can get my contact and I can uh, send you after. And about the second question, do you know any other? In Brazil? Yeah. You, mean, you mean in Brazil or across the world? No, not. Yes, I, I think you people in the U.S. you have such uh, great organizations. The, the the power of the civil society mm -hmm. here is so amazing. We have organizations across the the country. I had the opportunity two years ago to to visit across the country three weeks and to visit many cities in the in the in the U.S. And, and visiting many social projects for the LGBTQ community. So in Brazil, we have also a uh, civil society that is fighting for the, the civil rights, but as we don't have any help from the government, and as we told, we don't have much help for corporations too, so we are kind of to, to, to starting a movement, mm -hmm. and we expect that many companies could help us and other organizations. Thank you for the question. Here we have the last question here, and we have uh, another question for our virtual attendees. Is that the okay. last question for today? Uh, hi, first of all, thank you so much for uh, the work that you're doing in supporting uh, these local businesses. I think this grassroots 
uh, is really where you can make real impact, real change. And so thanks a lot for the work that you're doing in Brazil. Uh, I have a question uh, specifically on the work that you're doing with Itaú Bank because um, one of the, so one of the kind of, I would say not pushbacks, but one of the comments that come up when we approach within corporations to support these kind of small scale projects is that there needs to be a lot of due diligence and needs to be a risk assessment, like who are we mm -hmm. exactly supporting? And you said that a lot of groups also don't have, are not registered as entities mm -hmm. or companies. So especially with the bank being, uh, you know, very risk averse financial services. So how did that get smoothened out? Because that would be very interesting to know for mm -hmm. other companies and other sectors as well. Good, uh, good question. What we did is until today, we don't make this evaluation. Who does the evaluation is the bank. So what we do is the bank is involved in every process and in every stage of the selection process with us. In the final committee, the bank is there selecting the process. And after the process, the projects are selected, <coughs> they go through all the process uh, of, uh, of uh, how do I say, like the, the, the Cadastro, the, the process of the, the bank. The bank, they have their, their, their processes to, yeah, the, the, the forms that you need to fill. They check their, 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 all the status of the, the person who is leading the project, if it's an organization or not. So the bank is responsible for all these checklists that they do with the projects. And the bank today is also responsible for creating like for example, uh, an organization, if the organization doesn't exist. So if it's just an idea, the bank will evaluate who is the leader of the idea and will do all the checklists. And after that, the bank will create an organization so the person can receive the money and the person can do the, the management of the projects, the reports and pay taxes and everything that follows with that. But this process of evaluating all these checkpoints, it's not with us nowadays, it's with the bank. And we hadn't, we hadn't had any, any projects that were refused, you know? We had some difficulties because one person was in the leadership of an organization that uh, bankrupt, for example, or something like that. But the bank helped to solve this issue and create a new organization, so everything was uh, solved by the bank and it was uh, properly and legally done. And once they, they become an organization, they can get funds from other companies yeah. in the country. Yeah, but the bank is responsible for all this process. We, we don't do it for them. This is a responsibility, the responsibility from them because the money is going to come directly from them. The, the money doesn't pass through us nowadays. They're responsible for the management of, of, uh, of sending this income to the organizations. Thank you, and we have our last question for our wonderful virtual attendees. The question is, um, can you shed more light on what topics, hot issues, Divertidade tackled with local LGBTQ plus groups? More hot topics? That we, yes. That we're having nowadays? <laughs> what do you think? Think intersectionality is a hot topic, right? Because we, we have done a lot in the past 20 years in the US and even in Brazil in and the corporate so world. And, but it is not fair if the only beneficiaries of these initiatives, these corporate initiatives, are only uh, white, gay, and lesbian people. So intersectionality, I guess, is the, the hottest topic in this agenda. We must talk about senior LGBTQ people. We must talk much more about transgender rights, about people of color who are also LGBT, people with disabilities with uh, are LGBT. You? And we can talk about love. Yeah. We never had this opportunity before. You know, I just created a lecture for a consultancy called uh, the revolution of love, you know, because we never had the opportunity to talk about love inside the companies. And now we have. People are open to love each other, you know? It's like impressive. Love can solve every issue. So <laughs> we're having many great, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're having, 
<laughs> We're having many great uh, examples of how these hot topics are coming up, but for me, love is, is the one that we need to, to reinforce the most. And for me, I love to be here with all of you. I hope you love to be here with us, and I hope we can expand our capacity to love day by day, because this is what's going to change our society and our world. I yeah, love you. That's brilliant, because maybe we are the only movement mm -hmm. in the world who fights for the right to love. Exactly. That's it. That's us, the LGBTQ plus movement. This Love is you. It. Love you guys. Thank you.